a uh, few years ago, um, we tried doing a short weekend retreat at a different center um, than normally on the island of Oahu. Um, and uh, there was a, <clears throat> a monk who befriended, you know, our, our sangha and he was part of a, a community out there of some monks and nuns and lay people that were, had bought some land and were trying to build a monastery and had invited us to come do um, some programming out there and do a retreat. And so we were sort of, we're always looking for different, different places and different opportunities and different kind of communities, um, see what might be a good fit. And so we went, uh, we did this weekend retreat out in Haula. And I think, Barbara, were you there for that? Yeah. <laughs> and I think Tan was there. I don't know if, if Sun, I think you weren't. I can't remember if there were other folks here who might have um, come to that. Tan was managing that retreat. And um, the, the, you know, Friday, it was very, it's very, it was like very rustic, you know, uh, some kind of, old yurts and um, the Dhamma Hall was like a kind of a porch that had like a chicken coop screen on the outside you know that was the well, the walls were basically like screen big big screen and um, you know there wasn't they had set up like a kind of porta potty nearby but there was you know there were sort of like it was not very easy in terms of water and things like that. So we were sort of ready and knew it was gonna be kind of funky and I was working on my talk. Uh, I had my own yurt there and, um, and uh, I was working on it. I started to hear little kind of like taps on the roof of the yurt and thought, oh, must, you know, maybe it's like starting to rain, you know? So as I was kind of getting ready and it was getting dark out, I got my raincoat on and walked outside and, you know, just, I don't know, 100 yards or something to the hall. And it wasn't raining. I was sort of, I kind of noticed that. I'm like, oh, I thought it definitely sounded like it had started to rain. And then as I was walking, I was getting kind of pelted with little things and I couldn't kind of figure out what they were. Um, uh, and as I got closer and closer to the hall, it just got like, it turned into like getting little pelted by these little things to just the everything, the whole sky, everywhere around us was just enveloped in this giant swarm of termites that had unleashed from the, the forest. <laughs> and, um, and so I like covered myself and kind of like, you know, hurried into the hall. And then when I got into the hall, where all the yogis were, of course, it became clear that the screen that we had as the walls was not any kind of barrier to these creatures. And it was all kind of like, all the lights were those, what do you call them? You know, they're kind of like clamp on lights, you know, that you are, are plugged into a, a, a power cord somewhere. And so it was bright in there and there were just billions of termites just flying everywhere 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 and so we walk in and and everyone's sort of trying to figure out what to do it's like covering themselves and finally we're like we have to turn off the lights there's like it's obviously drawing them you know and so we we turn off all the lights it's pitch black and they're all covered in termites the the, the air is swarming with them they're crawling all over all of us like in our shirts in everything um and so i <laughs> had a shawl and you're just everyone's just like covered and and i had to give the opening talk uh in the dark uh covered my you know my whole face everything covered and everybody covered um covered in termites and uh and i don't even think we could do the precepts that night it was just like okay well and i gave the talk and you know we, we opened the retreat and basically people tried to kind of make it back to some people were staying in that building you know and their whole rooms were filled with termites other people had to you know go to their other places they were sleeping and i can't remember what the deal was in some of these places how how clean or not they were from termites but it was like it was incredibly dramatic you know just just like biblical it felt this sense of you couldn't talk without these bugs you know and um, 
And then the next day, most of them had died, right? Um, the, so there was just a carpet of dead termites everywhere and over the, the whole Dhamma Hall and people's sleeping areas and their cushions. <laughs> oh, it's crazy. And, and, and certainly the sense that this was going to happen again the coming night. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't like a once in a 20 year thing. Like this was, this was what nights were like in Hololo or something. <laughs> and um, it was, it was, uh, it was just so incredible, right? To be with this small group of yogis, many of whom really did not have much practice at all, you know? And, and here we were sort of trying to convey this um, possibility of freedom outside of conditions, regardless of conditions. And usually we try to do that in a context in which the conditions are like somewhat sane and safe and comfortable. You know? <laughs> and this is just like so dramatically not that. Um, and it was, it just felt inescapable, you know. And I remember that next morning, um, someone left a note, one of the yogis left a note, and it just said, I'm sorry, I'm not enlightened enough to deal with a thousand yogi, uh, th a thousand um, termites crawling all over me all night. I had to go. And so, you know, this, this, this one woman left. And um, amazingly, everyone else stayed. It really was just this one person left the retreat and totally understandably, right? I mean, this is like what we teach right, on some level, which is like, you try. You, know, you, you try to be in neutral, you try to be in like a little more difficult. And then when like chaos happens, you give yourself some permission to really get what is beyond the capacity of our mind at that point, you know, and, and retreat, run, go, you know, get out of there. Um, and also so poignant. And I think what was so powerful um, for the yogis that stayed uh, I just remember this one young man who had, had always would wanted to come on a retreat. You know, this is, it's of course very common. People get into practice, they get into Vipassana and they, they want to come into a more, you know, intensive experience and because of family or work or money, whatever many reasons, responsibilities aren't able to do it. And so he had finally, you know, gotten it so that he could do this. And, you know, just just like really unsupportive conditions, you know, that night. And so, but this very powerful understanding that came from that so quickly, you know, for him to say, it's like, I'd really try it to just sit there and notice the sensations, no tingling, not, and, and notice when my mind would think about what those sensations were and then scale it up right? So that it was happening everywhere, that it was like, I couldn't handle it. It was just crazy. You know what I mean? My mind would just spin out of control. But if I was able to just like narrow the attention on what was happening right now in my direct experience, it not, not only was it not unbearable, actually these sensations were somewhat pleasant, right? These were not unpleasant physical sensations. It was a sort of light tingling, you know? It was the idea that you were covering bugs, that was, that was like really, uh, you know, scary or, you know, frustrating or uh, triggering for people. Oh, so amazing, you know, so amazing. And, and that sense of really for me getting that, like, the question is never, are we free enough to be with what's happening? Are we enlightened enough to be with what's happening? It's almost always, how much do we want to be free? Right? Are we, do we want to be free enough to, to bear the intensity, to try to sit through what's, what we're experiencing, to try to stretch the capacity to be what's happening, to try to find some place of honest investigation, of genuine interest, you know, of concentration, of mindfulness, of calm, of metta, you know, whatever tools you are, it's like, how much do we want to be free? Because we always, you know, as, as yogis, kind of like we've been saying, you know, it, it's rare that we feel always the sense of progress, right? That we're 
more and more capable and more and more enlightened and more and more awake. Uh, I think part of the nature of the understanding is like the more free we become, the more sensitive we are to the places where we're not free, right? The more, the more we notice how entangled we are, how hooked we are, um, how where our where our difficult corners of of being of of the mind of experience are, and so this this process of um, you know it takes more courage as time goes on, <laughs> and you have you have more faith to fall back on, and that's that's unbelievably important, right? I mean that's that. There's no way to compensate for that outside of someone else, uh, you know, a spiritual friend offering you their faith, ensuring that, yes, you can do this and this is possible and you have the capacity. But when that faith internally builds of like, okay, I've been through, you know, I know I, I really, un we understand something, you know, we've been through hard things that we've been able to show up for in the past. That does give us some um, incredible strength to move forward into the places where, we still are challenged or we still have growth and learning and understanding and untangling to do. And it was, you know, really amazing to see everyone just show up for that. Everyone got together and swept and we did an extra little cleaning period. And, and it was held in the context of this place where it's like the people were just beautiful. You know, the other monks that were there were just like so generous and so wonderful, you know. Uh, you know, they spent the rest of the next day setting up this like complicated light setup outdoors so that if they did come back that night, at least the bugs would be drawn to the lights outside, but we'd still have light inside, you know. And um, the people from the community it was mostly uh, community from Laos out there who were doing the food and the cooking and, um, you know, under very kind of rugged conditions, you know, outdoor kitchen and making like just beautiful food and accommodating people's needs. And um, it was held in this container of generosity and goodness and carefulness that we see, you know, over and over again in our spiritual lives, how, it's, you know, the mindfulness, you know, that's, that's like the, our deepest security, right? But outside of that, we're held, we can be held by these broader conditions, you know, and, and how powerful they are, you know, to really receive the generosity that might be supporting us, receive the commitment to ethical precepts of, from our, ourselves or for others that, you know, we've taken during a period of intensive practice or that the people who take care of a space are committed to, it permeates, you know, as Michelle was saying the other day, a place where someone has become liberated on that deep, profound level, there is a, a restfulness that pervades and a, an energy that's not agitated it's like a like profound and relaxed that you can soak up you know you can you can abide in that you can be nourished by that right this the truth of the impersonal the, how impersonal liberation is and how impersonal suffering is becomes uh noticeable in these spaces where the fruits of someone's awakening can be enjoyed by all. And so we, you know, we made it through that day and people were, you know, practicing and um, that morning, you know, and then, um, then it was amazing. Around two o'clock, you know, it's like, I feel like we had sort of recovered sort of found some stability from just like the wildness of that. And at two o'clock, I think I offered a, a little metta practice. And as soon as I started offering the metta instructions, you know, guiding it, we started hearing gunshots. Um, 
it's sort of in the next part of the valley. And it grew and grew and grew and grew. And um, I remembered that they did mention <laughs> at some point that once in a while, uh, neck their neighbors w was a shooting range. And it was like, not just a few gunshots and a few rifles, like pew, pew, you know, it was like World War Three, right? Just like unreal, kind of just like machine guns and explosions. And we're all like in the back of the valley. So it's just like echoing. It's like, wah, wah, wah. It feels like it's everywhere. There's not a sense of like, oh, it's coming from over there. It just felt like we we're at war. Like there's a war happening and we are in the middle of it and we're trying to practice meta, you know? And, um, you know, it was ridiculous. It was like perfect, <laughs> like perfectly ridiculous, perfectly impossible. And, um, and it's like, we just did it, you know, the yogis did it. We went through another day because it was like the, apparently the, 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 the bugs did not come back that night, thankfully. The guns did come back the next day, um, but not till I think we were sort of wrapping up anyhow. But it's very powerful, you know, very, very, it was, um, it was quite an intense, memorable weekend. Um, <laughs> some of those yogis we haven't seen again, but I trust that the, the, <laughs> the qualities of mind they garnered that weekend really have, uh, will, will, will benefit them for many lifetimes. Um, but important, important and also, you know, really humbling to, to understand and see how fragile really actually the container of a retreat is and can be um, and how, how fragile our ability to practice and commitment to practice can be at different times for any of us, of course, really for, for, for beginners. But, um, you know, part of this week of really seeing how, you know, everyone is navigating, you know, in, in, in many ways, in any kind of classical sense, would be seen as as challenging conditions, you know, to to your meditation practice. Whether it's just simply the fact of having to cook for yourself and clean, and you know, kind of do your daily life chores and maintain yourself, where you know there is a a value placed on having some respite from that in order to be able to practice without a lot of responsibility, without a lot of agitation. Um, but then beyond that, you know, people are in the areas where there's smoke and fires or, you know, that, there's a whole range, right, of, 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 if you can imagine the, you know, 70 people that are here right now of just like the, the totally different conditions that people have encountered over our time together and how on one hand that's not optimal and we, it's like painful and it's poignant to know that we can't be in person with one another. And on the other hand, that there's like a, um, valuing of 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 those challenges right of like wow there's there's a strengthening and many everyone or many people have spoken of like wow the the feeling of how it feels integrated of how we have a sense you can go from like very super quiet in your practice to having to go outward and attend to things in a way that would maybe be normally more disruptive than it has been engage those things, feel whatever the intensity and kind of, you know, how evocative they might be, and then to be able to find our way back into quiet and that the, the engagement itself was different and we were maybe more capable of finding kind of some peace, some kindness, some you know, these beautiful qualities of heart in the moment. And then also being thinking we weren't going to be able to get settled again and then finding our way back into settled. And you know, there's a very powerful faith that can develop in that, right? A, a sense of, um, yeah, the conditionlessness of the of peace, right? That, that we have that capacity um, to find our way back into this quietude.
that question, that desire for deeper integration is of course something we we share, you know, with everyone that we hear from everyone, you know, this this understanding of wow, you with the protection, it's so powerful to be able to get to some more refined qualities of, of of attention at times. How hard it is to do that and to to have that feel like stable in our daily lives. And you know, often I think at the, you know, towards the end of a retreat, there's this sort of tension that kind of builds in the mind of like, oh, how do I, how do I hold on to this? Uh, how do I not lose this? How do I um, build on this? You know, which of course you either like, we have to have some humor with, right? That's that sense of holding on and not wanting to lose and you know that 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 tension that contraction is actually exactly the part of the of the of the dynamic of our of 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 our suffering of how we lose it right is the fear of losing it and not recognizing oh it's just wanting oh it's just fear oh this contraction that is a you know not looking forward to certain responsibilities or afraid of some future moment that isn't actually present right now and and that there's this tightening this constriction of the heart where can we see the wanting in that's happening right now? Where can we see the, the the tenderness, the fear, the vulnerability right now? That it actually isn't about the future. You know, it's not about some future moment. The concern actually is coming out of a, a, a an experience in the heart right now. And do can we find the space for it, the connection to it, the care? It's amazing when we start to believe in the objects again. It's like, oh, we've been training to not buy into certain thought patterns. And then suddenly certain thoughts are like, well, that's true. Like the, this is coming in two days and this is gonna happen. And, and then that feels so much more concrete, you know, and we believe those things. The great, um, Guinean um, anti-colonial thinker, organizer, Amil Cabral said, do not confuse the reality you live in with the ideas you have in your head. And I think there's something very important about that in terms of ourselves as yogis and ourselves as yogis going out into the world and how do we stay connected to the various aspects of reality, the various levels of reality, the various relationships to what we think of as real moving forward. And what are the implications of that, right? thought about something versus the thing itself, right? The, the future projection, the object in the distance versus what's arising and passing right now. How do we integrate these, these lessons, these teachings into, as we start to move into the world and engage more, you know, with, with people, with work, with responsibilities, with action, you know, that, that has impact outside of ourselves. There's one, one way of looking at the world around history that sort of sees, sees the sort of movement of history and the, the movement of action in society um, in a way that's it's called like, you know, dialectical, it's dialectic. And it has, you know, we talk about dualism in this tradition and in many spiritual traditions, the sense of trying to get out of a kind of dualistic nature of black and white, right and wrong, uh, you and I, right? These sort of separations, that that's the sort of natural inclination of humans, of beings in the world. 
and and that we understand that there's something deeper than that right there's a, there's another perspective on things that isn't just dualistic and and this idea that it's like in these dualisms is how the sort of movement of 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 action you know in history happens right where you know one one party wins the P, you know, that th that every action creates its own contradiction, basically, right? That it's like this party wins, this party gets upset, they organize and they beat out this party the next time, and then those people get upset and they beat out this party the next time, or, um, uh, you know, this things are society oriented in the way now that creates wealth also creates poverty, right? That that there's this this way of a kind of like dialectical. Um, aspect of how interactions unfold, how society unfolds, and how society keeps getting perpetuated in the ways that we see it getting perpetuated, right? This kind of constant conflict and, and tension and um, contradictions that keep kind of trying to negate each other and fight against each other and um, try to come out on top. And that we operate in many of those same ways, but that as yogis, we're really trying to, to find a different way to engage, even in our own practice, right? It's like if we were in this retreat at Haula and these bugs came, you know, there's the, there's the sort of dialectical response of like, oh, the bugs come, we swat them back. More bugs come, we build windows. Well, you know, we raise money to buy the people's land next door. We, or we call the police on those people and then those police people hate us and you know like this sort of sense of like oh you can relate to all this unpleasant sensation in a way that creates like more and more tension more and more conflict more and more samsara right and that we're training to just be like okay no we're we're trying to kind of withdraw from that internally understand that actually through observation through tenderness through kindness that there's an untangling an unbinding uh, a release that really is um, a very different way of being and that unbinds the internal kind of process, dialectical process of becoming also, because we are involved, like the inner process of, be, of being has a similar flavor. You know, the sense of, um, or we feel insecure and so we grab onto something pleasant, that stability there dissipates and so there's a sense of anxiety around that the anxiety creates fear or fear creates the unpleasant there's like this sort of like bouncing back and forth between the heart's response to one thing creating its own contradiction right the security we seek through grasping actually creates our own instability right the strength that we create through anger actually creates our own fear and so that that is the process that we go through and that that pinging around back and forth is is the process of our lives the the waveform that gets created in that pinging is the sense of self right the sense of me this tension right and then in in many ways all that's all the sense of self is is the tension that gets formed through this grasping and rejecting of objects that are out of our control in, in our response to the instability of things. And so this sense of like, oh, we just, you know, we feel tense, we feel anxious, we don't wanna feel that, we wanna feel pleasant, we wanna feel happy, we wanna feel, and it's like, we don't see the way maybe that that is just buying into the same process, right? It's buying into this polarity of not wanting this, wanting this. And like, of course we wanna be free. <laughs> of course we wanna be liberated from, from suffering, but we have to accept that as paradoxical rather than contradictory, right? That it isn't like we're looking for the opposite experience because every time we look for the opposite experience, or try to overwhelm the experience with what we think of as the opposite, we're actually recreating this dialectical process internally of ourselves, of, of reestablishing this tension. And it's amazing the degree to which we can use our own spiritual practice to do that.
and to really how hard it can be to understand that love is actually not in opposition to hatred. Wisdom is not in opposition to ignorance. And, and, and that is a very different orientation that we've been basically trying to teach all week, right? The sense of the, we don't go to love as a, as a rejection of hatred, right? Or of anger or of fear. It's a sense of like, actually love has the capacity to include hatred, right? Love it has the capacity to include fear that it isn't a rejection or a grasping onto the experience, just as the purest forms of mindfulness aren't a rejection or a clinging, right? They're a very different orientation toward it. And one that actually then does not generate more tension, doesn't generate more striving, more me in this process. But it's a very, it's a very difficult orientation to um, internalize, right? Partly because we've been taught that way and trained that way in so many ways that it's like, oh no, you fight this with this. And this comes and you you get rid of it through doing this other opposite thing. But when we start to see, it's like the more we try to do that, the more we re-entangle ourselves. And that this process is actually quite different, right? This process of rather than creating more conflict and contradiction and con confrontation, that there's a, a disentangling, an acceptance, an inclusivity, a sense that nothing need be outside of our capacity to care. Nothing need be outside of our capacity to be at peace. And that leads actually to the opposite experience, right, of the disintegration of this contraction of selfhood the disintegration of me, mine, of the, of, the, of the contractions around experience, around the future, around the past, around whatever might be elsewhere. I'm hesitant to get into too much of this, but I do want to offer a little bit of um, of how the a few different ways that the Buddha spoke about this process of building more tension and conflict and the release from it. And this this they call you know dependent origination, paticca samuppada, uh, or codependent arising or dependent co-arising or whatever it's still sort of getting at it's not really described in most places in a sort of this kind of dialectical way but you can fill in the gaps to kind of see it in, in a certain way you know what what is the condition for birth uh, what is the condition for old age and death the buddha asks birth is a condition for old age and death What is the condition for birth? Becoming is the condition for birth. Now, the, the, the hesitation here comes from wanting to like avoid getting sort of what seems like too metaphysical in terms of like, well, what is becoming? And what is birth in these sort of like, mm, the sense of rebirth. But I think it's important to recognize like this is, this can be thought of in a more sort of like mystical uh uh, a bigger way in terms of multiple lifetimes, but also it's describing a, an experience that's happening each moment in relationship to each experience, that there is an experience of coming into being and that the, the process of coming into being is preceded by becoming, right? There's this sort of like leaning forward into the moment of like, where does this process of becoming, what conditions what is the specific condition for, for, for becoming? Grasping is a condition for becoming. Is there a specific condition for grasping? Craving is a condition for grasping. 
What's a condition for craving? Feeling tone is a condition for craving. What's a condition for feeling tone? Contact, right? So pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feeling tone is the condition for craving. Craving is a condition for grasping. Grasping is a condition for becoming and then being, right, in birth. And what is the condition for pleasant, unpleasant, neutral to arise? Well, contact at the sixth sense source. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, right? That the, the object and the sensitivity come together and there's contact, this consciousness, right? That's a little bit of a dialectical process there. So this idea that this is like happening every moment, every moment, there's this, um, every moment that isn't seen clearly, this process is unfolding. But the more we can see it clearly, the more we see contact, contact, seeing, hearing, smelling, thinking, 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 sight, 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 smell, smell, smell. This is why we're trying to refine the attention to be that clear and that precise. Then when it's seen clearly, and it's seen as insubstantial, it's seen as only coming into existence because of conditions and it immediately fades away, then all those other chain of events don't happen, right? The, the feeling tone of it doesn't lead to craving. Craving doesn't lead to grasping. Grasping doesn't lead to becoming. Becoming doesn't lead to birth. And so you have the, the dual side of like, well, on one hand, it doesn't, this idea in Buddhism that you stop coming to be born again and again. But also that the sense of non-self per pervades. There is no, there, it, w when this is fully uprooted, when things are seen so clearly that there's no more belief in satisfaction is gonna come from any experience. This unhooking, this unbinding, well, the sense of self stops arising, right? That doesn't mean we stop existing. It doesn't mean we stop engaging in the world, but we are unhooked or unleashed from the oppression of the tension that we experience as me, as mine. And then the reason this is like uh, relevant as we go out into the world is that this isn't just around our own sense of self that gets eradicated, right? And later on in that same sutta, he says to Ananda, he says, so it is Ananda, feeling is the cause of craving. Craving is the cause of seeking. Seeking is the cause of gaining material possessions. Gaining material possessions is the cause of assessing them. Assessing is the cause of desire and lust. Desire and lust is a cause of attachment. Attachment is the cause of possessiveness. Possessiveness is a cause of stinginess. Stinginess is a cause of safeguarding. Owing to safeguarding, many bad, unskillful things come to be. The taking up of the rod and the sword, quarrels, arguments and fights, accusations, divisive speech and lies. Suppose there were totally and utterly no safeguarding for anyone anywhere. When there's no safeguarding at all, with the cessation of safeguarding, would those many bad, unskillful things ever come to be? And so we have this understanding that there are many aspects of dependent origination, right? Of what leads to what and what is the, what is the process of coming into being? What is the process of cessation? What are the, the many unskillful and unwholesome uh, experiences that come from not seeing feeling tone, right? I mean, just that just that sense of not seeing the pleasant, unpleasant, neutral quality of some experience leads to craving, to seeking, to gaining, to assessing, to attachment, to possessiveness, to stinginess, to safeguarding, taking up the rod and sword, quarrels, arguments, fights, accusations, divisive speech and lies. And so this sense of like the profound responsibility actually that we all carry for our actions, you know, and that, that the, the possibility of our actions becoming kinder, more generous, less constrained, less internally oppressive and less externally oppressive come into 
fruition come into blossoming through this understanding, right? The cessation of ignorance through understanding, through seeing. And that when there is no, you know, in the, in the Buddhist kind of in the Pali language, all of these things are often talked about as the negative form, you know, non-hatred is considered metta, loving kindness, right? It's a, it's, it's the, the word is the non-hatred, but it means love, right? It has the positive notion, has a positive connotation. So this sense of non-stinginess, non-attachment has the implication of generosity, of goodness, right? Of, of this naturally and unrestrained offering of our goodness in the world. And I think that there's, you know, again, on self-retreat, very, you know, it's one of these things where we would never say, oh, it's great to have to go and get groceries or go deal with something that you have to go to the doctor or go whatever, you know, the people have had to run errands this week. We'd always hope that someone could have the protection of, you know, being in the distant mountain somewhere and just being able to watch, you know, lifting, moving, placing. And, and it's like, at the same time, so many people have reported this sense of like, wow, going into the world is very intense. It's sort of disorienting. Everything's moving so quickly. A lot of tension builds up. But on the other hand, there's moments of like real connection, you know, amidst this wildness, it's like, oh, I was able to really be kind or really patient with someone or someone was really kind to me and I really felt it and then was kind back to them. And this, this other dynamic arises because of, in part, our lack of um, reactivity or maybe not lack of reactivity, but that because our reactivity of the heart is seen and cared for, but not identified with, not bought into, you know, to any degree, then it arises and passes and there's room for something else, right? There's room for um, something more beautiful to emerge. And that those are also practices, you know, the sense of cultivating our goodness and cultivating like our kindness of heart, cultivating our generosity, cultivating our compassion, our sympathy, our patience. I mean, even if you look at the seven factors of awakening and think about them, not just in terms of our internal experience, but with another person, with a group of people, you know, where is interest and investigation? When you are truly interested in someone and their opinion, their view, then it's like, oh, the energy builds, you know, where's the sort of deeper resonance and enthrallment that can kind of come from that? Where can that move into a space of calm, of concentration, of unification, and of peace? You know, how do we build peace within ourselves and how do we build peace with another person? I'm hesitant to say that they are the exact same process, but there are things to be learned from one to the other. There are definitely things to try and to practice and to, to see what are the ways that the lessons we learn about how to be with our own fear, how to be with our own anger, translate to how we might be with someone else who's very fearful or very angry, very deluded. What is the appropriate response? Is there enough strength? Is there enough capacity and interest in that moment and energy to show up and try to connect and be interested? Is there not, right? And we go back to this training of like, oh, when there's not, we move away. We understand we can't be in a skillful dynamic with someone at a certain time. Are we interested in someone just so they change? So that they come to see things as we see things? You know, is that how we want to relate to our own hearts, right? Is that the training to just like, oh, be interested in the mind as long as it behaves how you want it to behave. Be interested in the body as long as it uh, ends up like you want it to, you know, that's, that we, of course we do that, right? Of course we bring attention to the pain in some part of us, conscious or not, hoping that it will make it go away. 
And part of this process is that purification of motivation, of seeing that, of seeing the pain of wanting. And that anytime the wanting is at play in our motivation, in our action, it's going to impact. It's going to re, uh, re-instigate the dynamic of tension, of the dialectic, right? It's not going to untangle it. It's not going to undo it. It's just wanting. And this is profound. You know, it's profound. Even, even you know, the degree to it's like we want to be free and how beautiful that is and how important that is. You know, we all want to be free from hatred, from the pain of it, the toxicity in our hearts, you know, of, of wanting, of ignorance. We want to be free, but we also see that the prison is made of wanting. And so where does that leave us, right? It's like we, the wanting might be pure and beautiful, but we can't use it to unhook ourselves. It won't work. It just rehooks. <laughs> uh, and how many times we have to learn that and how much, you know, with other people, uh, of course, we have to go through this a lot as well give ourselves a break, you know, give ourselves a credit. We, we think that by allowing, by not getting into fights, by not arguing, uh, that somehow it means we've given up or don't care. And it's always so important to really question that, you know, question that assumption of like, oh, wh- why would we think that not arguing means we don't care, <laughs> you know, or, or actually like being patient and resting and being kind means we don't care, right? It's like we care about an idea, care about this person. Where does genuine connection, genuine kindness find, uh, allow us a place of contact, of connection, where investigation can build, where relationship can build, where connection, uh, the metaphor of concentration, of peace can, can come into being between people. You know, all of these all of these lists, all of these practices are worth trying out in the world around us or in relationship to the world around us, whether indirectly in terms of people uh, or in terms of just our responses to, to the world around us. The paramis, you know, of dana, uh, generosity, morality, renunciation, wisdom, courageous energy, patience, truthfulness, determination, loving kindness, and equanimity. You know, obviously I'm not going to go into a long thing about the paramis, but you can see like what a beautiful list that is and how they all have aspects that are wholesome in terms of our internal life and and wholesome in terms of our external life. And ones that are, again, liberating, not producing of more contraction, of more identification, of more um, tension and bitterness, but of more goodwill, generosity, understanding, honesty. I think the the piece around concentration and mindfulness, that that relationship is important, you know, in terms of really understanding, again, relationship with other people that, you know, we've talked about a number of times that there's places in the tradition that really focus on this, like, all-encompassing concentration that's, you know, engulfs the mind and our whole sense of being into this connection with some object of experience. And I think that we often hold our relationships to that kind of standard um, also to our detriment, right? Where might we learn the lesson of actually momentary concentration, right? Of, Of short moments of connection 
that include mindfulness and care and then release connection mindfulness and care and release where it's like we don't fixate on on the connection and the concentration and the the unity that arises from those as being something that needs to last in order for it to be valid as if we're ever going to get quenched through a relationship lasting rather than the valuing of oh, a moment of connection oh moment of a connection, the moment of loss, moment of connection, the moment of loss, that, that the heart learns wisdom in that and has perhaps a more reasonable expectation of relationship. And I think I just want to say that, you know, while there are ways in which I do believe that the spiritual mechanisms at play in this practice around the 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 non-dialectical non-generative un, untangling unbinding uh release of the self through practice through understanding and love that will have some very important things to offer in terms of how we think about relating to the world, right? Because we know how much the opposite creates more tension, more contradiction, more conflict. I also know that the goals are also different. We're not aiming for an untangling of society, an unbinding, a, a, a non-existence, a non-perpetuation of the world that it is that, that, that there's something different also about the spiritual practice and the practice of the world and in society. And so there very well may be times where any one of us or all of us are actually gonna play the dialectic in the world, right? That we're gonna choose one side over another side because it's something we believe in and we feel like is important. And so I don't wanna, I don't wanna dismiss that as valid and useful and even perhaps inevitable <clears throat> in terms of our work in the world. It's just that we would then expect different results, <laughs> right? So that we're not surprised <clears throat> that when we engage in conflict in the world that feels meaningful, that feels important, that feels necessary, that that's going to create a countervailing response that that we're going to have to show up then <clears throat> for our comma, the results of our actions. And if we have generated that, then we show up for it. And we understand that we are the inheritors of our actions in that way. And that we make decisions around that. And that if we show up in a different way, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> if we show up, acting outside of the dialectical force with just love and just equanimity that we will definitely protect our hearts and we will definitely create goodness, but we might not create any outcome in the world that is at all what we might want, right? That, that in doing that, you also have to totally let go of the outcome. <clears throat> of thinking that, oh, because you're kind and because you're generous, that's therefore going to change somebody or change someone's behavior or change a dynamic. It's like, you can't have it both ways. You're either playing the dialectic or you're not. And if you're playing, you, can be sh you won't be surprised by the response. <laughs> and if you're not playing, you shouldn't be surprised by the response, right? So either way to just know that it's like, <sighs> we're entering back into the world, you know, over the next couple of days, most of us, you know, some people might be able to stay quieter for longer to different degrees. But at some point, you know, we're all sort of in this process and to just trust that it matters and that it, there's learning along all of it. There's learning around being, just deciding that it's the ethics that you're gonna to commit to. It's the kindness you're gonna to commit to and having that be the, the framework but knowing what that means in terms of what we're letting go of. Or going out and having, you know, these qualities be our motivation 
and trying to change things and trying to be involved and knowing that that is going to involve some frustration and counter forces. Um, but that either way, we understand our own motivation, that we understand what is motivating our actions and that we take responsibility for those and trust that there isn't, you know, there, we will uh, inherit the force that we put out and the more we can practice, the more we can watch that in every moment, right? Of seeing like, oh, when I relate to this experience with this mind state, this is what happens. With the arising of this comes the arising of that. And, you know, when, when this is gone, oh, then this is gone. You know, with the cessation of this comes a cessation of that, right? This, this deepening understanding internally of the impact of the volitional force of our action in every single moment and how we inherit the immediately and at times down the line, the results of those actions. Then we have all we need, right? We have the tools we need to act, to try our best, to know that we will sometimes make mistakes and act outside of our deepest longing for ourselves, but to not be surprised, of course, when we bear the weight of the, the impact of those actions. This is, um, you know, the Dalai Lama is known to have said, you know, my religion is simple. My religion is kindness. That's that side of the Brahma Viharas, right? Of loving kindness. It's like that pure. And then there's the other side, the equanimity side, where you can say, oh, my religion is simple. My religion is ownership of action. And both of those are true. And they're true together. And they're true apart. So let's just uh, sit for a minute. Hope you have a good um, period of walking or whatever you have next. And um, we'll see you in a little while for the metta chant and sit.